He was basketball's boy wonder. This kid was never going to be a role player. Oh. He was going to be a star. That's the way you run a fast break. Youngest ever to play in the NBA. What would you do if you're a father and your kid comes up to you and says, I can go to college for four years, or I can go make three or four million this next year? Kobe Bryant gets up off the bench. Here he comes. He's into it. Put the shirt tail in, son. Now a boy in a man's world. Guys go to strip clubs. I don't know what strip club for. For what? Bryant with three. Here to play basketball, man. A loner who kept his private life secret. He enjoys his privacy, and his privacy vanishes as soon as he steps out of his room. The high school kid from Italy who tried to take on the entire league all by himself. There were times when I just would shake my head. You know, this kid needs to calm his game down. He needs to learn how to use everybody else. I don't think it's a selfishness. I think it's just he just feels like he's invincible out there on the court and he can't be stopped. That's got the people up out there. He has so much ability that he feels like nobody can stop him and he can do anything. Go, he's out the show. He got everybody in here going crazy. Finally, they brought in a guy who knew how to win. He took shots with guys hanging on him with teammates wide open. So I had to question his vision. Does he see? Does he know these guys were open? The boy wonder began to grow up. That's a beautiful jumper. And I could just see it in his face. Look, I just want to win. I just want to win. He might be the best total player in the game. This is Kobe Bryant. I'm not sure I've ever seen that move before. Beyond the glory. June 2000. The Western Conference Finals saw the LA Lakers pitted against perennial rival, the Portland Trailblazers. The Lakers had led 3 to 1 in the series, but then Portland came back, winning the next two and forcing a game seven. In the fourth quarter, the Lakers were down by 15 points. That was the moment I used to dream about when I was a kid. Being in those type of situations, being in the NBA Finals, uh, being on the road, being put in a position in the backs up against the wall. I mean, everybody thinks that you're going to lose the game. Each of the three previous seasons had seen the Lakers knocked off in the playoffs, twice by Utah, and then in 1999 by the San Antonio Spurs. Now it appeared the Lakers were just minutes away from another frustrated offseason. And Pippen pulls up for three. And Portland's off to a great start. But then, midway through the fourth quarter, Kobe Bryant got hot. Kobe. Kobe Bryant's three. It's Kobe again. And suddenly, it was showtime to the sequel. was finished. And six games later, so were the Indiana Pacers. Just four years had passed since 17-year-old Kobe Bryant had sprung out of high school and straight into the NBA. Now he and the Lakers were world champions. But Kobe remained an enigma to his teammates. They wondered, who did this kid, Kobe Bryant, think he was? Our conflict since basically day one has been how much you want to do on your own and how much are you going to do in the team offense. But it was not so much who Kobe was as who Kobe was determined to be, the best player ever to play the game. father's playing on TV, I would have a little setup, a little hoop in the living room and I'll play, you know, while he's playing. Then when they take a timeout, then I sit down and I take my little timeout. I remember putting on a little jersey, like one of those little white tank tops. My mom used to help me. She used to scribble my dad's number on there. 
Kobe Bryant's earliest memories are of basketball. It was just then when I was like four or five years old. I just wanted to do it. Just wanted to play. Bryant gets around short, now the middle, scoop shot on the way, falls in! Kobe's dad, Joe Jellybean Bryant, played eight years in the NBA, first for the 76ers, and then San Diego and Houston. When Kobe was six, Joe signed a deal to play in the Italian League. For the next seven years, the Bryants lived in Italy. The lifestyle and the culture was pretty easy to adapt to. But the language, man, <laughs> I think it was like the first day I got into a fight with this kid, because he said, Nero, guarda, Nero, Nero, which means look, black. Now, I guess he's never seen a black person before. And uh, I thought he said, you know, look, you know something else, look nigga. And that guy and I wound up becoming best friends <laughs> my first couple years in Italy. So. Kobe soon began to learn Italian and came to speak it fluently. He speak uh, like, uh, not so bad like I speak English, but <laughs> he speak really well, really well. He speak uh, Italian uh, uh, normally, like if it was his language. Seven, he got his first leather basketball. It became his constant companion. He even slept with it. But finding a game was tough, unless the game was soccer. 13 guys would show up and come down to the court uh, ready to play soccer because they would have the soccer posts right underneath the basket. And so I would just stay there and play. With them. Then when they finished, I started playing basketball again. Joe and Kobe kept tabs on their favorite NBA teams by watching videotapes. Kobe studied these by the hour, trying to memorize the moves of his favorite players. Magic, he was the top one. You know, when Michael was coming up, I didn't like him too much. But I was a Magic fan. Kobe hung out with Joe's Italian League teams. It was like a correspondence school in basketball. Every time the players stopped their training, Kobe would immediately jump on the basketball court. He would get the ball that he always had in his hands and would start shooting. At the end of every game here in Pistoia, I remember that Kobe, going on court, would steal the ball from the last player that had it in his hands because he wanted to practice his shots. The audience would sometimes stay longer only to watch him, a 12-year-old boy shooting at a basket. In campo, on the basketball court, his personality was very strong. For example, he rarely passed the ball to the other players, but he usually made the basket, so he had a good reason not to give the ball away. In 1991, Joe Bryant retired from basketball and brought his family home to Philadelphia. That November, while scanning the sports section, Kobe was surprised to see Magic missing from the Laker lineup. The next morning, my mother comes in and tells me he's HIV positive. Dang. What does that mean? You know, can he play? Is he going to be all right? And so she, she had to explain everything to me. And that broke my heart. Because of the HIV virus that I have attained, uh, I will have to retire from the Lakers. Magic's retirement spelled the end for Lakers Showtime. It would be nine years before a kid from Italy would help bring it back. In 1991, Joe Bryant brought his family back from Italy to live in Philadelphia, where he'd once played with the Sixers. His son Kobe had spent the last seven years of his life as an outsider in a foreign land. Now he found himself a stranger in his hometown. Most of the time, I didn't understand what people were talking about because they used to speak slang all the time. I would go home, and I say, what does it mean when, you, when somebody says, uh, why are you sweating me? What the hell is he talking about? What does he mean by that? But when it came to Kobe's basketball talent, nothing was lost in the translation. Basketball is universal. No matter what you spoke, if you can go out there and play, it just didn't matter. You know what I mean? You was going to fit in no matter what. There was a big buzz in the town uh, about a 13-year-old who was playing at our middle school. And after five minutes, I turned to my assistant coaches and said, this kid's a pro. Philadelphia's a big basketball city. And there were a bunch of guys my age who, had a, who already had an established reputation of being the top players. 
so I had to come in and prove myself to them. Given Kobe's game, he had no trouble proving himself. But making friends was another story. He was popular from afar and likable, but he's very guarded. He's very careful with who he lets in. He played ball. The ball was his best friend. Uh, weekend nights when he was younger, he didn't go to parties or hang out. He played ball. He'd be like a senior in high school playing at a middle school. Uh, nobody could touch him. Nobody could stop him. In the fall of 1992, Kobe started at Lower Marion High School. He was six foot two and the finest prospect his coaches had ever seen. We heard there was a, a former ball player's son coming. Supposedly he was a pretty decent, flashy player. And there was this tall, skinny kid, you know, around six foot four, 87 pounds, it seemed. He was wearing his father's Italian uniform, stuff with Lecoque Sportif on his shirt and whatnot. And it, it was awkward, but as soon as he stepped on the court, you knew what he was all about. One thing that made it almost easy to coach Kobe and I think maybe instantaneously gain the respect of his teammates was his work ethic. He would practice more than anybody else that I ever saw at high school. i come in into the uh, facility early in the morning, 5.45 or so, and I'd hear the thumping of the basketball. I went upstairs and there was Kobe still in drills. I would stay late after practice and I would work on a particular aspect of my game. Then we'd go out into the game I would see it paying off. And that was the most important thing to me. Because you, you can spend hours and hours working in the game, but if you don't have the confidence in those skills to execute them during the game, then they mean nothing. Lower Marion High's basketball team had been nothing to shout about for half a century. But now, with the new kid from Italy, the team started to draw. We started off, we were playing in front of maybe a hundred people, our parents, and maybe a few of our friends and this and that. And as he got older and as we got better, the crowd started to fill up. We went from having two or three hundred um, people at a boys basketball game to having um, 1,500 and it became fever pitch. We won 20 games when he was a sophomore. You would look at Kobe as an opposing coach when he was in 10th grade and say, oh my God, I've got to deal with this for two more years. In Kobe's junior year, Lower Marion went to the state tournament but lost in the second round. The loss left Kobe devastated, but determined. One thing I'll never forget Kobe saying was, I'm not allowing this to happen again. So it's almost comical to hear him say this. So we are kind of just like, Kobe, relax, it's not your fault all that, but he took it personally and, and said that he'd, he'd win the title the next year. The next year, Kobe kept his promise. Lower Marion went all the way, winning the Pennsylvania State Championship for the first time in 53 years. Kobe was named All-American High School Player of the Year. That spring, Kobe, by now a celebrity himself, escorted the pop singer Brandy to his high school prom. Well, you know, I just bumped into it. I didn't have a date for a prom. I just asked her to go. One of Kobe's classmates was the daughter of John Lucas, then coach of the Philadelphia 76ers. Lucas had seen Kobe play and invited him to work out with the Sixers during the offseason. The big buzz at the time was that he was just ripping up Jerry Stackhouse at one-on-one. -on -one. Possibly at that time was the first seed that was planted that maybe college was not going to be a part of his future. I like this uh, Michigan. my top school right now. I love to see him. Kobe was heavily recruited by all the top basketball schools, but his goal and lifelong dream was to play in the NBA and he wanted it now. I have decided to skip college and take my talent to the NBA. We're flabbergasted with his decision. How can he say he's gonna do this? He came across looking a bit arrogant. He came across looking naive. But Kobe had his own agenda, and he didn't care what anybody thought. 
getting smeared all over this town. And so was Joe. So it was a, it was a difficult time, but Kobe had a dream. What would you do if you were a father and your kid comes up to you and says, I can go to college for four years, I can go make three or four million this next year? Did you say to him that he has to get a college education at some point in his life? Oh, that's part of the deal. I mean, that's, that's automatic. He had all the attributes where he could have gone to college and would have survived very well in college and done well in the college game and had plenty of time to come to the NBA and play. But he was anxious to be here where the game was the best. When people uh, knew that I was contemplating going straight to the NBA, the Wolves came out immediately. I have decided to skip college and take my talent to the NBA. When Kobe Bryant announced in 1996 that he was skipping college and going straight to the NBA, he was bombarded by a hailstorm of controversy. I saw it on the local news, and I just remember thinking, what's with those goofy glasses on his head? Who does this guy think he is? It was pretty wacky to think that here's some kid you went to high school with who's going to the pros. It was all over the place. It was in the newspapers, it was on radio talk shows. Should he do this? Should he do that? You know, education first, you know, sports this, this. He's not ready. The you know, parents are messing up. They didn't raise him right. It's crazy things, silly things. Only a few players had made the leap successfully from high school to the NBA, and they were big men. Kobe was 6'5", small by NBA standards. Laker general manager Jerry West had heard about the brash kid from Philadelphia and wanted to see for himself. He invited Kobe to work out with the Lakers a few weeks before the draft. We put him against Michael Cooper, who was one of the really great defensive players we had in the NBA. We played him against Larry Drew, and it was a joke to watch him march over these people. Um, and the kid was 17 years old at that point in time. He told me, he said this was the greatest workout that he'd ever seen in his history of working out players before the NBA draft, and that Kobe had the chance to be one of the greatest players to ever play the game. I thought it was an absolute easy decision to try to do anything we could to get him. The Charlotte Hornets select Kobe Bryant from Lower Marion High School. The Charlotte Hornets picked Kobe in the first round, 13th overall. Jerry West then astonished many observers by offering his starting center, Vladi Divac, in trade. There were some upset people that when we made that trade. They might deny that, but there were some upset people because we traded a starting center for him and a very good player in Vladi Divac. But I've always felt that the things that set teams apart is risk taking. Trading Vlade seemed a lot less risky only days later when the Lakers signed free agent Shaquille O'Neal to replace him. The dynamic duo was in place. In the summer of 1996, Kobe, along with parents Joe and Pam, moved to L.A. to begin living out his dream. Kobe was playing in Los Angeles Laker uniform, and uh, it was just amazing that 10 years ago, when this kid was uh, eight or nine years old, that now he's, he's playing in the NBA against me and I play against his dad. The fans were anxious to see him play, and Kobe lost no time in showing the fans he could play. In the rookie All-Star game, he led all scoring with 31 points. Then he ran away with the slam dunk contest. But despite these heroics, Laker coach Del Harris wanted to break Kobe in slowly. He viewed me as being a young kid, which I was. Uh, he wanted the other players uh, to respect me. He wanted me to work for my opportunity. And, and I worked so hard, and I was already working harder than everybody else. But he felt like he had to be 10 times harder on me than he was on Eddie Jones or, or Nick Van Exel or whatever. And that wasn't fair. When you draft a high school kid, everyone wants him to play, but we had a very good team then. We had a particularly deep backcourt. Uh, there just wasn't a lot of minutes for Kobe to play. I thought Dell did a nice job with him, but Dell was in an awkward position because people wanted him to play. Kobe 
Toby had spent the better part of his life as an outsider, first as an American in Italy, then as an Italian in an American city. Now his age set him apart from his teammates. When Kobe came in, he was 17 years old. So here you have somebody that, that's making the jump from high school to the NBA. Not only that, but he's surrounded by grown men from 21 up to, you know, almost 40 years old. After a game, if a guy wants to get together and go out, have a drink or, you know, or something like that, Kobe can't participate. I don't want to go in the bar for I don't drink. I'm under age anyway. I don't want to go down there for Guys go to strip clubs. I don't want to go to strip club for For what? I'm here to play basketball, man. I need to do that type of stuff. But there was more than just an age gap separating Kobe from his teammates. The Lakers had a problem with his tendency to shoot the ball almost every time he touched it. There were times when I just would shake my head. This kid needs to calm his game down. He needs to learn how to use everybody else. And once he does that, the sky's the limit. By the time the 1997 playoffs arrived, Laker coach Del Harris was frustrated with his 18-year-old star, yet in overtime against the Jazz, with the season on the line, he let Kobe have the ball. Kobe, to the right corner, shot over Kobe, that's way short. As players, I think we all questioned, not because it was Kobe, but because it was a young rookie, um, even though he had all the ability in the world, you know, we're playing on the team with Shaquille O'Neal, we're playing on the team with Eddie Jones, we're playing on the team with Nick Van Exel. Bryant for the time. Kobe threw up three air balls down the stretch. Utah won by four. Another air ball. That was a tough position, um, I think, for Dale to put Kobe in. By the next season, some in the media were calling Kobe the next Michael Jordan. Kobe Bryant is not Michael Jordan. He will never be Michael Jordan. He does some things that look like Michael. He's a completely different player than Michael Jordan. But Kobe had no interest in being the next Jordan. He wanted to make the fans forget number 23. His first opportunity came at the 1998 All-Star Game. Kobe Jordan struts it. Here comes Bryant, head of the field. Jordan, baseline. You're not shying away at all from Michael. You're going after him, aren't you, Kobe? I'm just having fun. I'm having a good time, man. Yo, Michael's a great player, one of the best players of all time. And there was a better way to learn the game than going at him. Kobe went at him, but that night, Michael was the best. Four months later, the Lakers were hot going into the 1998 playoffs. And now a steal by Kobe. Foot race with Darren Strong. And the Jazz beat them in four straight. 96-92, and the sweep is complete. Many said the Lakers' failures stemmed from disharmony between stars Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal. More blamed Kobe than Shaq. Everybody knows Shaq's the man. But why it could be two great players playing together, I don't understand. There's no need for that. There's no need for uh, guys bickering. You know what I mean? I even told Kobe that. You know what I mean? There's no need for that. You guys need to go out and play and win. As the new season approached, one thing was clear. If the Lakers were ever going to rise to their potential, something or someone was going to have to give or go. At the tender age of 20, Kobe Bryant was living the modern American dream. He had a $71 million contract with the NBA's marquee team in the nation's most glamorous city. He was wildly popular with the fans, especially the young ones. Kobe's talent and star quality were obvious, but to his coaching staff and teammates, he was a headstrong loner whose showboating style hurt the team and cost them key victories. That's the part that, you know, probably a lot of us question and a lot of people on the outside of our organization question is, what exactly are your motives in thinking that way? You know, is it just because you feel like you're that good or uh, are there for some other personal reasons that do not involve what's best for this basketball team? Kobe changed alone in a cubicle off the locker room 
and rarely spoke to his teammates off the court. He described the worm, Dennis Rodman, as the perfect teammate because the two had never spoken off the court. There's no question that he's not really interested in the quote-unquote personal part or the, um, you know, the co-worker part of being in the NBA. I think Kobe, growing up in a different era and growing up, um, you know, overseas in Italy, he has chosen to be a loner because if he looked around, there, there, there's not another Kobe Bryant. The fact that we don't uh, go out and uh, hang out in clubs or go out to movies together, I think it's simply because he enjoys his privacy and his privacy vanishes as soon as he steps out of his room. In the spring of 2000, Kobe met Vanessa Lane on a music video soundstage. I met her, and I'm like, hey, what's your name? Like, Vanessa. And that was it. She had like a little sparkle in her eye and everything. And that was it for me. <laughs> the relationship left him with even less time for his teammates. Magic had a comment that I had to hang out with the team, you know, and go to clubs and go to bars and that in order to build team camaraderie for us to win. And, you know, I respect Magic so much, but to me, that was just an off-the-wall statement. You know what I mean? Because, you know, how, how is that going to make us win a championship? For me to go out to a club and hang with the guys and do this, that, and the other. There are other ways we can go about doing this. Kobe kept his distance from the other Lakers, and although neither man would admit it, he was stuck in an ugly rivalry with the other star of the team, Shaquille O'Neal. They're like, you know, worrying about whose team it is, who has the most commercials, and all of these other things. They have their egos, and they both want to be the top dog. They also want to be the main focus of the offense. They also want to be the main focus of all the, the media attention that's out there. Many on the team blame their misfortunes on Kobe's refusal to meet Shaq halfway. Meanwhile, Shaq was calling Kobe the boy wonder in interviews. He didn't mean it as a compliment. Then, in 1999, tensions rose to the surface when Kobe and Shaq scuffled during a practice game. The relationship between, um, you know, both Kobe and Shaquille is one that would definitely remind you of two brothers, one being the older brother and, and one being the younger brother. And the big brother's always been able to tell the younger brother what to do. And years go by, and all of a sudden, the younger brother's a little bigger, a little older, a little stronger. For three seasons, the Laker management did everything they could to bring out the best in Kobe Bryant. They traded Eddie Jones and Nick Van Exel, giving Kobe more time on the floor. They replaced Del Harris with Kurt Rambis and gave Kobe the league maximum $71 million contract. Then, in the 1999 playoffs, the Lakers lost again, swept this time by the less talented San Antonio Spurs. San Antonio sweeps. Laker owner Jerry Buss, who had always avoided paying big money for coaching talent, bit the bullet and coughed up $30 million to bring Phil Jackson to L.A. The former Bulls coach had six championship rings and a talent for handling headstrong stars. Phil's a, a terrific communicator. Um, he's an excellent manager in, dealing, in terms of dealing with, uh, with players, uh, dealing with a team. But before Phil had a chance to work out a truce, Kobe and Shaq made their own attempt at reconciliation. The occasion was Kobe's 21st birthday at an L.A. restaurant. Shaq surprised everyone by showing up. Phil Jackson's most immediate challenge was how to reel in his young guard. I was like totally aghast at some points that he, you know, he overran his teammates. He chased the ball on offense to get to the basketball. Uh, he took shots with guys hanging on him with teammates wide open. Phil worked to convince Kobe that the team's best route to winning was through Shaq. That it was all right to pass the ball because he'd get it back. This message was not new. Kobe had heard it countless times from Jerry West, Magic Johnson, Del Harris, and Kurt Rambis. But it took Phil Jackson to finally get through to him. The reason why I had genuine respect for Phil because I could tell right off the bat that he was serious about the game and that he loved the game. 
I think that Phil Jackson has been great for Kobe Bryant. He's stern, uh, but yet he'll give him a little bit of rope. But when he makes mistakes that are costly and makes mistakes that are where he's trying to do too much, Phil will remind him, and he'll also take him out of the game. The team just really came together. It was just a culmination of so many different things, and it was exciting. Uh, you know, Phil coming in and, and, and all of the ingredients that he brought to institute tremendous team play. Once they figured it out, everything fell into place. The Lakers finished off Portland. And then beat the Pacers in the finals. They were world champs at last. Then once we finally win it, it tastes really, really sweeter after you've gone through some type of uh, adversity. Just wants to win. That's his attitude. Just wants to win the game. Win games, that's it. Both Kobe and Shaq had come to realize that the whole of their combined talents was greater than the sum of the parts. I think we just wanted room to operate. I think if you look in the past, like you look at Kareem, you look at Magic, he just passed the ball. Kareem shot it. And Magic loved to do that. On this team, Shaq and I, we're both, you know, quote unquote, killers. You got to go for your throat. And it's just a matter of us finding out how we can do that and do it together. Kobe Bryant was on his way to achieving his ultimate goal, being the best ever. But now even he knew he couldn't do it alone. In April of 2001, just before the first round of the playoffs, Kobe Bryant married his 18-year-old sweetheart, Vanessa Lane, in a private ceremony. Because, you know, I miss her so much. Like, when I travel, I'm going to the road, and she misses me so much. Um, but when, we come, when I come home, you know, I'm just so happy to see the person. Uh, and she knows that this is my job, and this is what I have to do. And she knows how dedicated I am uh, to this game. So our relationship is great. When the next season began, many of the old conflicts returned. Shaq complained that Kobe was hogging the ball again. And Shaq was throwing bricks from the free throw line. Peter Bessie. He missed them both. But when the playoffs arrived, the Lakers got down to business and played like a team. The best team in the league. and the Sixers to defend their title. Kobe came back from an ankle injury and stepped up, making the big shots. But Shaq got the MVP award. Kobe, if it wasn't for Shaquille, you know, could definitely have been in, in, in the MVP run. The finals, um, I think, proved that, you know, he'll go down in history as, as you know, one of the top two, three, four, five players um, to ever play this game. For the Los Angeles Lakers. Then, in February 2002, the prodigal son returned home to Philadelphia for the NBA All-Star Game. They weren't glad to see him. They booed Kobe Bryant. Kobe scored 31 points, was named MVP, but it was a painful reminder that to the Philly fans, Kobe was no hometown hero. He had left too quickly and too often. In their eyes, he would always be a stranger, but maybe Kobe the loner liked it that way. It had taken Kobe Bryant four years to mature to the level where he could help the Lakers win the NBA championship. Some thought those four years might have been better spent in college, away from the NBA spotlight. Kobe transgressed one of the things I think that's really a mistake. College is our farm system, basically, in the NBA. And I think that it's important that players go to that process, learn how to succeed in a peer group setting that's mostly their own age group. But if Kobe's was the road less taken, there's no doubt it got him to where he had always wanted to go. You know the saying that people say, uh, uh, the guy couldn't chew bubblegum and walk at the same time? He was like that early on, man. He worked his butt off, man. Uh, get to the point where he is now, it's, it's incredible. At the age of 23, he was already a five-year NBA veteran. He helped lead his team to two world championships and was heading for a third. 
Still, Kobe Bryant remained a work in progress. No one among us expected that he would become the number one American basketball player. I think he will play in the league for another 10 years or so, and he will leave the NBA with, with five or six rings and a Jordan-like legacy. He's going to be one of the best players to ever play this game. He has really scaled things back and has learned to use his teammates better. Uh, there's a tremendous room for improvement in him. He's going to be better than what he is today, and that's pretty scary. He was a team player now. But Kobe Bryant continued to go his own way. I constantly tell people, man, if you have a dream and you want to achieve something, don't let anybody tell you you can't achieve that. Because you can be whatever you want to be. You can strive for whatever you want to strive for. Don't let anybody tear you down.